Hey, everybody. Welcome to Perpetual Motion, a podcast focused on lifestyle, self-care, communication, and positive relationships. I'm your host, Dr. Mo Anderson, best-selling author, award-winning podcast host, TEDx speaker, and speaker coach. If you are, like me, a life learner who wants to live, lead, and love better, you are absolutely in the right place. If you're new to the show or a returning visitor, let's make this official. Hit that subscribe button now to learn more about my books and speaking services or join my email list, please visit drmoanderson.com. That's moeanderson.com. Joining me for this episode is Kathleen Donnelly Israel. She has a fascinating story about walking the pilgrimage, aka the Camino Santiago de Compostela. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> it's a 500 mile trek across northern Spain, and she did it at the young age of 69 years. Stay tuned to learn not only how she did this amazing feat, but why she did it and what she learned. You can't say. Dr. Mo ain't tell ya you that fear magnifies the consequences of failure. What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? I'd rather live like I'm dying than live to die any day. My heart is pure, my soul is safe. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you, Dr. Mo. I'm so happy to be here. Happy to have you. Wow just reading about what you've accomplished, what you've done. And as a senior, I'm a boomer too. So uh, I'm always looking for inspiring stories. I I don't say that uh, 60, 70 is the new 40, but it's just a good place to be. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. I'm so happy. And that's the thing is to be happy and to be at peace. That's what I want for everyone. Let's start at the beginning of this journey. You were a caregiver for your husband who had Parkinson's disease. Can you share a bit about that period of your life? Yeah, um, my um, when my husband was like 51 years old, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's and he probably had it for a few years before that, but we just didn't know what was wrong with him. Mm. And, and so... Um, you know, he was okay for a while, but in 2010, he became totally disabled. And I had to be here to take care of him. And um, so um, he was a happy man, though. Some people get mean when they're sick, but not him. He, you know, I kept taking him to healers, and they would be all blown over and tell me the amazing healings he had gotten. And I think it was his spirit and his, um, you know, his, um, anyway, he was happy. (laughs) And uh, like before he died, he was like, couldn't walk, couldn't talk. And he got this um, survey from one of the close universities here. Mm -hmm. And it was a happiness survey. And he felt, he said he wanted to fill it out by himself. And, uh, Everything was happy, 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 happy. The whole, wow. the whole thing. <laughs> that is beautiful, and it really reinforces that we get to choose our attitude. Because if anybody had a reason to say they were not happy and to have us understand it, he did. But he he just focused on the positive aspects of his life, including having you as a caregiver. Had you ever done that before? Had you been a caregiver? I mean, yeah, obviously I, our children, but yeah, not so right. that's what I'm thinking, children. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, but you know, um, when we got married, I, um, I, I was 20 and I very seriously thought to myself the night before our wedding that you know, Kathleen, this is going to be our life from now on. Not is my life is not good. It's not going to be my life anymore. It's our life. And so when he got me, when he got sick, I wanted to cure him, you know, cause I'm mm-hmm. like, this is my life too. You know, if, if you're going to be doing this Parkinson's thing, it, it, me too, you know, it's, right. you know, we're, 
And uh, he actually did not want me to be his healer. He wanted to do the medical model of Parkinson's disease. And so all the things that I came up with, you know, he didn't want to do any of them. He just wanted me to be his caregiver and accept him the way he was. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what I got to do. You know, I, I, you know, you can't make somebody do stuff. Um, A couple of things there. You've used the term healer twice now in a way that I think I'm not accustomed to. When you say you took him to healers and yeah. To be his healer. What what do you what do you mean? I don't understand that. I know. I wanted him physically healed. That's what I wanted. I see. And I I like um I live in San Diego, so you know, I'd hear of healing uh like a healer came to, to LA, just a hundred miles north. And I took him up there, plus this other lady who had MS. I went and got her and we drove up there. And uh, she paid for the gas uh, because we were quit pretty poor, you know, because he had to quit his job. And um, so, uh, yeah, I would I just took him in there. I took him. There was somebody named Breco or something. I took him there. And um, just, so these are these are spiritual healers. They're not physicians like in the right, Western tradition. Right. Medicine. OK, we will, okay, that's we will pray do. over you. Got it. Okay. Okay. And lay hands on you. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then there were some in San Diego and I would bring Ron there and, you know, uh, they do the big group and then you bring them up and they put hands on them and, and stuff. So um, we were trying everything. We did a novena um, Catholic. That's what Catholics do. They, they pray for nine days for a, a, a something. And so I heard about this guy um in uh, in the catholic church you have to have some miracles before they'll call you a saint right. and so there was i got this holy card and it said this Solanus casey uh needed a, a miracle and i'm like oh good we'll give you a miracle we'll just do a <laughs> novena and you'll just heal us you know and 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 um so we just after the nine days we just kept praying anyway and you know, um, I uh, I wanted to heal Ron, but I realized the heal the person who got the healing was me from that novena because I was really angry with Ron um, before um, before that when I was caring for him, I was angry at him for not wanting to try and do things to make himself well. I was angry uh, that he uh, he wanted to take those meds they gave him. But, after, you know, like he could move, he could like move before he started taking those meds. But after he started taking those meds, if he didn't take them, he couldn't move. Like one day I was just like, oh, man, you know, and I'm not a meds taker. And so uh, one day just to please me, he didn't take his meds and he was like a stone. I mean, his body was like a stone around oh him. He couldn't, he couldn't move. Huh. And. And that made me angry because before he didn't start taking those, he could move, you know, wow. and that. So I, I had some stuff going on here. And um, in any way, so <laughs> I'm the one that got the healing from that novena because I wasn't angry anymore. You know what? That's that's a good thing. And, and I'm glad you shared that. I started with that question because so many people have become caregivers and we kind of take for granted how stressful mentally, physically, emotionally that can be, obviously doing it out of love, but it takes a lot out of you. And, and I've encountered some people who, you know, became bitter or angry or depressed and there, you know, you have to take care of yourself within that. And you just, well, God was taking of, care of me. <laughs> God was taking care of you. And as a side effect <laughs> of trying to help your husband, you, you helped yourself. So I'm, I'm happy that you did find some healing for yourself during what had to be a really difficult period. How long were you guys married? 48 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he didn't, he couldn't, he couldn't make it to 50. We had to die at 48. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, 
marriages aren't making it to three years now, let alone 48. So that's that's quite impressive. And I'm happy that you did get to have that time together. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, when he was sick, um, I uh, I had a he couldn't have one of those electric wheelchairs because his eyes kept going closed. And so I always had to push him in one of those other kind of wheelchairs. And mm -hmm. so I would just get, I could just get him dressed up in his suit and we would go to the theater, the live theater over in Balboa Park. And mm -hmm. uh, we went to the beach. I pushed him along the, the boardwalk and we just, um, we did stuff. So you, you were training for your walk before you'd even thought That's about the right. walk. I was <laughs> I was, you know, had a good core after that. Yeah, those leg and arm muscles. I see, I see, <laughs> I see a pattern developing here. But uh, that's wonderful that you did uh, continue to go out and get him out. I'm sure that was part of that uh, happiness that he was feeling. Was yeah, we 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 still went out on dates. Mm -hmm. Sweet, I like that. I like that. So while he's uh, ill for some years, it seems you spent time studying in addition to novenas and healers you spent time studying philosophies of various thought leaders why was that important or necessary for you uh yeah so i had to be home and i had my internet and um so um when i was a, i had a rough childhood um my father was an alcoholic rageaholic child molester and i had um, you know, it's pretty sad. I my I feel bad. My children had um, a person with post traumatic stress disorder for a mom. You know, that was rough yes. for them. And then, um, so I've been trying to heal myself for years. You know, going to shrinks and you know going to um, adults molested children meetings and you know stuff like that. And um, so I had to be home and I thought, well, I'll just study online with these enlightened thought leaders who had ways they what the reason why they were doing what they were doing is because they wanted to help people heal. Mm -hmm. And so there was this guy, Darius Berezunda, and he had speakers like every week he would have speakers and then you could buy their program and like maybe somebody would have uh, give you their program for free. Or else there were other ones, maybe it was sixty-seven dollars, something like that. And I would buy a program, and I would do the work. I mean, it would come, and I would, you know, sometimes it was CDs, sometimes it would download, you know, different kinds of things. And I would do the work. I would do the sleep tapes. I would do, you know, all kinds of stuff that I did, and I would just work it um, till I came to the point when it wasn't interesting anymore. And God would send me another healer and I would do their work. And I just felt like God was just leading me to my healing. And what I think the reason why they got kind of boring after a while is because God sent me this healer and would raise my vibration to this point. And then I didn't need them anymore. And God would send me another healer and raise my vibration to this point. So just, you know, over the years, I raised my vibration and um, and then um, I could be happy because I spent my most of my life being really sad with a sad story to tell. Yeah. And then when I realized that um, telling your sad story is perpetuating, you know, your sad story, <laughs> you know, you need to somebody told me one time they said, well, why don't you just make up a different story? And I, and I told them, well, gee, that wouldn't be true, but you know what? The more I told my sad story, the more I was attracting sad experiences. So I had to turn that around. One of my healers told me, um, just imagine yourself walking down the street and you can see behind you, but you know what? If you turn the corner, you can't see that stuff anymore. You got a different view out the back if, when you look back. And so that's what I had to do. I had to turn the corner so I wouldn't have that stuff behind me anymore. And um, what I think is um, I, I came in with a low vibration. I think I was a spirit out with God in the universe. And I heard 
that if you want to raise your vibration, you can go into the earth and be a human and you can raise your vibration because unconditional love will raise your vibration. So I decided to come in and be a human, even though knowing that I would be attracting really awful experiences with my low vibration that I came in with. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I just kept attracting more and more and it just kept getting more, you know, low, low vibration. But I think my spirit remembered that that's what I wanted to do because I always wanted to be good on my, I just wanted to be good. I, you know, I just did. And I, And I didn't know that I needed to let go of that stuff. And, you know, it's really kind to listen to somebody's sad story. But you know what? It's hurting them. They don't know it. But it is hurting them to tell the sad story. Got to make up a good story. You got to notice something good that you can think about and Mm -hmm. think about it. Uh, Because the sad story just... um, it just perpetuates it. And you know what? When my husband was ill and I would tell my sad story, somebody come over and I tell my sad story and he would be like with his hands going like this sad ways going like he's telling me not like, to stop. Get yeah. And I, I was the hurt that he didn't want me to share that. But you know what? He knew, you know, he had had some healing probably from those healers I took him yeah. to. But uh, he knew, but he couldn't talk, you know, so um, yeah. but I just it, felt I, fe- I felt hurt um, when he didn't want to listen sure. to that. But that, you know, changes the way people interact with you as well. When you talk about what you attract yeah. by telling that. And I tell, you know, I, I have a, a serious chronic health condition and I tell it and I'm around, I'm in a lot of groups of um cancer patients and on a lot of forums, but where I find it interesting is when you tell the story, but not in a sad way, and you Mm. tell it for the purpose of this is how I grew from it. This is the positive thing that I've learned. This is what I'm doing now for the purpose of inspiration, because the story helps people connect with you. But you're right. Mm. So many people tell the sad story and it's just, oh, feel sorry for me. Oh, woe is me. But, you know, we need to know the point of why things are happening. I I heard I heard that it can be an addiction. You know, we're addicted to our sad story. And um so um, what I what I realized was um, that all this sad stuff that came in to me, I attracted it in. So when I realized that, all of a sudden I wasn't a victim anymore. Mm-hmm. I had control. Um, I had brought it in with my sad story or my low vibration. And so, um, yeah, I. I don't even feel like I need to forgive anybody anymore because I'm just really taking responsibility for bringing that into myself and, um, and, and loving <laughs> yourself and your life. It sounds like, so you, yeah. that, that moved you that totally changed your mindset, your way of, of thinking about your life and your experiences. And then I guess you formed your own philosophy philosophies from that from your experiences and the information that you took in is that right yeah yeah and the the cool thing about the abuse is that you can't even do unconditional love without adversity because it's easy to love the people who love us Mm -hmm. so you you kind (laughs) of need you know the adversity uh so you can do the unconditional love so it was like you know, really the sad thing about it, you know, was the abuse. But the good thing about it is, you know, it required unconditional love. And so I can do that. I, you know, um, this priest told me one time, he said, if you don't forgive your father, you don't understand God. And I was like, oh, man, I gotta, I gotta understand. I have to, you know, I gotta forgive my dad. So it was like, one of these one day at a time things, like I wake up in the morning, I would hate him. And then I would work on it and I would forgive him. By the next morning, I needed to do it all over again, you know, and it was just like, 
one day at a time, one day at a time. That, that is very real. I mean, we all go through that too, where we'll yeah. hear, you know, we'll hear a speaker, we'll read something, we'll hear a sermon or whatever, and you just get in a really good place. But then, you know, years of something having been done to you and being right. treated a certain way, you really are unlikely to just get over that in a moment. It's a gradual process. And, and we get frustrated sometimes because it's like, okay, Absolutely. why am I back having these thoughts and feeling this, you know, just being in the room with this person, but I, just the awareness and, and the continuous growth in that direction. And, and, you know, especially when they're not on that journey with you is <laughs> yeah. really hard when you're getting they're the same behavior, <laughs> right? And you're trying to be forgiven and love and they're still being a butthole, but it is possible. It is possible. And you may even have to put some physical distance there, but you can love and forgive and, and be just kind and a good person. It's an action. It's an it action. Is, it's a choice. It's an action yeah. and it's a choice. So I've never heard of the pilgrimage you took. I know Mecca. I know some other pilgrimages, and I, I've gathered from what I did see online that it, it is a really big deal. And I, I make no bones that I know about everything mm -hmm. going on in this great big world. I'm anxious to learn more about this. What is the history of that pilgrimage, and why do people do it? Well, um, back in the 1200s, uh, I, I don't know. I've read a bunch of stuff. Some people say the 900s. Some people say the 1200s. Between the 9 and the 1200s. Um, yeah, give or take a century. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, oh, I should start before that. Okay. The Apostle of Jesus, St. James, mm -hmm. back in the day, their day, went to the Iberian Peninsula to try and tell people about Jesus. And he wasn't very successful. So he went back to Jerusalem. And they martyred him. And then the story goes that some angels brought him back to um, Spain and buried him there. There's probably some people with the help of some angels. I don't know what it is. But anyway, there's something involving um, shells. And uh, anyway, um, so in the in the nine to the twelve hundreds, they were trying to get the Moors out of Spain. Uh, and um, St. James appeared and helped them, and they were successful. Mm -hmm. And so then they, <clears throat> then they found his grave, and everybody was like, we, you know, we love St. James. Thank you for helping us, stuff like that. And so they started a pilgrimage to the grave of St. James. So St. James, Santiago, is the same, you know, that's in Spanish, Santiago is, and San Diego too. San Di um, so there's a bunch of different ways to say Wait, so it. so Santiago means James? Iago. Santa, San, San, Santiago. San Iago is James or Diego. They say it a bunch of different ways, but okay. anyway. Didn't know uh, that. Yeah. So, um, so the, the cathedral now is over the grave. I mean, they got the grave of St. James there and they built this giant cathedral over it. And uh, so now, oh, in the 70s, so they, they decided to resurrect the, the pilgrimage again in the 70s. They had started it in the 1200s. Um, and they, you know, were kind of finding the path and it was basically there because it was an old roman road mm -hmm. but they had built some freeways over it so they had to make some underpasses you know so the pilgrims could go under the freeway and actually i did walk on the freeway sometimes <laughs> which was pretty exciting <laughs> uh and um so um yeah that and so nowadays uh people like only by 30% of the pilgrims are like Catholic doing it for a pilgrimage, you know, for Catholics. Uh, the rest are just people in the world that maybe, uh, like I met a guy, um, pretty sure he's Hindu, lived in L uh, LA. Mm -hmm. um, I met him there and he had lost three of his friends in rapid succession and he just felt like he couldn't do his life anymore. And somebody suggested he go do the pilgrimage 
the Camino Santiago. And that's why he was there. I was there um, because I, um, I thought that Ron and I would be riding our bicycles across France in our old age. I mean, he was an athlete, a triathlete, and I was a wannabe athlete. So I just you know, I was always trying to think of what Ron would like to do so we could have some fun together. And uh, so that's what I thought we were going to do. And when he got Parkinson's disease, I thought, well, I guess not, you know. And um, so while I was caring for Ron in 2013, my friend Judy went on the pilgrimage mm -hmm. and she documented it on Facebook. And I got to see, you know, what she was doing. And, and even though she got blisters and bloody feet she had a picture of her bloody feet you know um I realized she was doing something very special for herself and I just at that point I decided you know what when Ron's done with his disease I'm going to walk the Camino too and, and I'm glad you kept that promise to yourself how, how long yeah. does it take to walk 500 miles and how do you train for that uh well most people don't take as long as me because I had, um, uh, I took 66 days I was on the Camino. Some people will do it in 35 or 45 days. Um, I, um, you know, I was done with my task. I was done caring for Ron. I had all the time in the world and I actually gave myself three months to do it. I, I got my airfare home three months after, you know, it was three months later, I was going home. And uh, I I did set up some things to do over in Scotland. I, I like to paint. I'm an artist. I was, I took a painting class, um, wow. an, an icon painting class over in Scotland at the end. But um, basically, uh, when I started walking, I thought I was going to walk like uh 10 miles a day. I, I walk in San Diego. I was walking with my friend Severa and we walked five miles and it didn't even make me sweat. You know, it was, it was lovely. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought, well, I can just walk five miles before lunch, five miles after lunch. I'll be good. You know, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And then my sister-in-law uh, told me, Kathleen, you're going to have to walk up mountains because the <laughs> when I walk by the bay, uh, there's no mountains over there. Yeah, it's pretty going to be pretty <laughs> flat there. Yeah. Yeah. A little rolly, you know, not even hills. And um, so she found all the mountains in San Diego and we walked up them. And after a while, I put a pack on and tried walking up hills with a pack on. And um, also during that time, I was volunteering at a horse ranch for autistic kids and they needed volunteers. And I am afraid of horses and so I thought well if I go and work at the horse ranch maybe I won't be afraid of horses anymore so that's why I was doing you that know what? you you are one of the most courageous people I have interviewed I just really like the way you you tackle challenges and fears and uh passion. I know but you know what I'm still afraid of horses <laughs> <laughs> well but. there's that that part but you try to confront that fear. And, you know, I think I think there's a lot to be said of that. That takes courage to even. But I, even I think, try. you know, toting those wheelbarrows full of horse pucky uh, gave me a good <laughs> gave me a good solid core, too. Mm -hmm. Well, plus rolling Ron around on his wheelchair. But uh, anyway, so, so I was strong and I. You know, even though my health was really down from caring for Ron, I, right. you know, I, I had body issues and stuff like that. Um, I, I was pretty strong, actually. Yeah. And you are, you are pretty strong emotionally and physically, obviously. The, the, my last question about this walk, and it, it's just been crazy the past couple of weeks. I normally would have been all on YouTube and everywhere checking out this walk just because I love learning and it's something new. But in my mind, I'm vision, envisioning this big crowd of people walking all together. But if you're telling me some people take 35 days and some, you know, like you said, right. walk a couple of months. So you just out there walking by yourself on this road? 
Yeah. Um, so um, I I put out on Facebook, I said, I'm going on the Camino. Anybody want to go? And nobody wanted to go. Nobody, <laughs> nobody stepped forward. And uh, so um, I have three, uh, four guardian angels that I know personally, and they came with me. And so uh, I wasn't afraid. And I read books, you know, and people do it alone. Actually, if you go there and you walk with someone, you're going to have to walk fast for them or they're going to have to walk slow for you. You know, it's like, you know, nobody walks the same amount of fast. Okay. And uh, so every once in a while, I would meet someone and walk with them for a few days. But then the thing is that, and my sister-in-law told me this. She said, the reason why I didn't say I wanted to go with you is because I wanted you to have that spiritual time between you and God being alone on the Camino. Hmm. That's deep. And, yeah. What? Um... <laughs> you said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just hearing so much here that's enlightening. I, I do believe in guardian angels, some of the mm -hmm. Protestant Christian Baptist persuasion, but you said you know them personally. I feel like mine are yeah. there, but I don't know that I know them personally. How, how does that work? Well, um, my children in our neighborhood, um, there was this lady, Gretchen, and she formed this group. It wasn't like something that she heard about. She just formed this group of little children in the neighborhood. And we, they would go over there and say, they would say a decade of the rosary to start with. And then they would do uh, some kind of craft, like they make cards and go to an old folks home and bring the card to an old folk or, you know, something like that. They did the, no, they, they did the nativity uh, play uh, for the old folks home and mm -hmm. they just did uh, charitable works and one day you know I used to go you know for crowd control <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, she had these little coloring papers for the kids that they would color their guardian angel and it was there's just kind of a really famous picture of an angel standing over these children walking across a bridge yeah and, I'm so, saying that yeah and so we were coloring that and I love the colors. So I was coloring it too. And then she said, okay, um, you can, you can meet your guardian angel. You just sit there and uh, just think about your guardian angel, just use your imagination and think about your guardian angel and just say, um, guardian angel, please tell me your name. And so um, I did it too, you know, mm -hmm. and I got the, she said, whatever you think of first, that's their name. And so I thought I did that and, and I got Lunk and I'm like, what kind of a name is that? <laughs> you know? And then I got this image in my mind of me sitting next to this giant angel, like a bouncer or something. It was this giant guy angel and mm -hmm. me, little me sitting next to him on a bench with his arm around me. And I thought, well, with my history, I probably need a bouncer angel. And so uh, that was the first time. And she did it the next year, too. And so I'm like, okay, uh, guardian angel, what's your name? And I got this uh, Mary Bell. And so Mary Bell is this little flittering around angel, just gregarious, happy, you know. Like a cheer up or. Yeah, yeah, just and I thought, well, that's balance between the bouncer and the, you know, <laughs> the the happy, gregarious, um, little flying around angel. Um, uh, so those are those two, Lunk and Mary Bell. And then I have, I I walk in my neighborhood, and so I have there's skunks in my neighborhood, and I just did not want to meet a skunk, and so. I was walking along and I'm like, oh, dear God, send me some angels to protect me while I walk in my neighborhood so I don't see a skunk. Mm -hmm. And so I got this image of these two angels and they're walking next to me with their wings up over me, uh, just like they're facing me with their wings touching at the top. And um, so one of them 
was wearing black and red robes. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird for an angel. <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, oh, I live right by San Diego State University. So maybe, you know, that's San Diego State's colors. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But then the well, and we really don't know how angels dress. I mean, we have this perception, but <laughs> I don't know. We're team colors. We don't know. Yeah. I, I, got, <laughs> I got this wild imagination here. And um, so her name's Aloysia. And the other one, her name was Pionomi. And wow. she is wearing a like a sage green robe that's kind of gossamer with purple flowers on it. Anyway, they uh, walk with me in my neighborhood and they came, all four of them came with me to Spain. So I was just, you know, I actually know them and uh, I know what they look like. And uh, yeah, I know their name. Yes, yes, you do. Thank you for sharing that. That is <laughs> that is quite fascinating. And it has to be reassuring for you to know uh, that they're yeah. with you. So how did you change as a result of this experience, this two month long walk, if I had seen your post, I would have thought wonderful, but I don't have two months off to go to that. Right. Yet. I'm so, a reach retirement age. So I think some of your friends might have declined for that reason, just yeah. the time issue. But how, how did it impact you? Um, well, you know, when I got married, I got married right out of my mother's house. I went to Ron's house, you know, and even though we were both young, he was 22, I was 20. And, um, you know, I never was by myself ever in my life. And when I was raising my five kids, I uh, once in a while, I thought, geez, maybe I think I would like to try loneliness for a while here. You know? <laughs> Not alone, but loneliness. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. <laughs> I think I'd like to give that a spin. <laughs> and, I understand. <laughs> so, um, so um, I one of the things I learned was on the Camino that I could really take care of myself. I could go out and get myself food. I could, um, you know, handle all the problems that came up on the Camino. I could take care of myself in sickness. Uh, yeah, I. I, I, that's, that's one thing I did learn. And then, uh, and uh, also um, the time I have in the past been in, like I did the Phoenix project with, uh, with a group of people. And what the guy said during that time, he said, during the Phoenix project is sacred time. So we are going into this project as the sacred time. And uh, when it's over, we will step out of sacred time, but this is sacred time. And that's how I felt about the Camino mm -hmm. was sacred time. And then, um, you know, the thing about the Camino is, I mean, I read so much and they said, okay, you, you're going to meet some, some angry people on the Camino. And that's just to, that's just to hone you, you know, to, um, to help you grow. And, um, and so now when I meet angry people, I realize it helped me grow, you know, and, um, and I believe now that my whole life is sacred time oh, and, uh, my, my whole life is a Camino. I'm, I'm on a Camino here. I'm on, on, a, on a pilgrimage in my life. No. And, and really, we all are. What, what a wonderful yeah. outcome of all those experiences and, and that you are just at peace and, and happy. And, and I would want that for you. You've been through a lot of challenges. So I'm glad you're in a really, really good space now. Before mm -hmm. we go, share a bit about your best selling book, Wisdom on the Camino, and, and tell folks a little bit about it and how they can get it. Um. The um, Wisdom on the Camino came out of when I got home from my trip, I thought, OK, it's time to write the book about your teachings that you learned from those thought leaders. I just wanted to get them out into the world. I shared and I real well, I wanted to write that book, but I was reluctant to be teachy. I, I maybe, um, you know, I just didn't feel like an authority 
<laughs> or something. Mm-hmm. Right, and right. and so I remembered that I told people all those things on my Camino. I, you know, people would have a problem and I would share something that I learned from those thought leaders with them to help them. And so I, I, uh, so I wrote the book about walking the Camino and telling people those things. So it's kind of like a faux help, self-help book because I tell about, you know, the healing um, on the way on the Camino. Um, but it's also the story of the Camino and uh, the beautiful scenery, the um, the wonderful people I met, uh, the amazing experiences and adventures. So um, it's it's much more than just a book about the Camino. Uh, and it's much more than uh, a self-help book. <laughs> you know, it's it's the story of um, walking the Camino. And I, I want one thing I want to tell everybody is there's a gift for the people who read my book. And like, you know, I shared my journey with my friends on Facebook and mm-hmm. uh, and then they were all like, you need to put these pictures in the book. And I thought, well, then the book will be fifty dollars. You know, that's not going to be okay. And and because I wouldn't put them black and white, that wouldn't be good. Right, at all. you want color, and that does drive up the expense a lot. Right. So I made a website with galleries and portfolios, uh, gallery for each um, uh, chapter. But you have to go in the book, and right across from the table of contents, it says, "Read this first. And it explains how to see the pictures. You can't just go to the website and see the pictures. You have to go through, you know, what it tells you to do across right. from the table of contents in the book. And then, and and so when you read chapter one, you can look at the pictures for chapter one and like that. Okay. Okay. I like that. I like that. So folks, when you download a copy of Wisdom on the Camino or purchase a copy, remember as an added bonus, you get to see a photo gallery of what sounds like an amazing adventure through some beautiful countryside. Thank you. And if you, if you, if you, um, if you download it, be sure and read it because I get paid per page. You read it. (laughs) So, um, you know, go through the book. Okay. Because uh, (laughs) downloading it, you know, I don't get anything, but um, if you, that's, that's a little, little author thing that people don't know that now we're streaming pages like these artists are streaming, (laughs) streaming uh, songs on demand. So yes, please uh, read it. Please listen to full podcast because we we need the the time that you are listening to be significant. So all of that to support creators and authors and and people that you like and to help them grow and share their great message like Kathleen Israel has done here today. Tell us your uh, website and what social media you're on. Uh, Okay, well, I'm on Facebook, uh, but I'm on Instagram, but I I haven't, um, I'm not, I'm not like I'm an old lady, you know, (laughs) I need to figure this out better. but I, uh, my website is wisdomonthecamino.com, H-T-T-P-S, W-W-W, you know, stuff like that. Right. Um, and uh, you can just click on the link on my website to buy the book. Or um, um, I'm sure Dr. Mo is going to have the... Um, it will be in the show notes. It, yeah, the, the clean link right. to the... And if you go on Amazon, you just put wisdom on the, and it goes to wisdom on the Camino, so... Um, it's not, it's there. <laughs> nice. Good search engine optimization. So yeah. there you go, folks. Thank you so much, Kathleen Donnelly Israel, for sharing your experiences, your adventures, and for writing wisdom on the Camino for those of us who can't take that trek so we can go uh, <laughs> with you and, and just enjoy the photos and everything. That was really smart. I'm glad your friends encouraged you to do that. And I appreciate your time here today. Listeners, Kathleen Donnelly Israel has been our guest today and she's been fantastic. I'll Thank be you, back. Dr. Mo. Oh, Thank you, you so are much. most welcome. <laughs> I'll be back next week with another fascinating guest. I'll be here and I hope you will also.
Thank you. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group, and I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and re-you. Thank you.